welcome you to the Odyssey Church. And for those of you who may not know me, my name is Rob Welsh, and I am the lead pastor here. And we just want to thank you for being here on this wonderful Easter morning, or as some churches call it, maybe more appropriately, Resurrection Day. Resurrection morning, the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we know there's a lot of places you could be, a lot of other churches you could attend, so we just want to give you our heartfelt thanks for being here this morning. It's great to see so many people that I do know, but I see a couple of you here that I don't know. And if you would, we'd appreciate if you take the opportunity just to fill out one of those green connection cards or in the back of the chairs or in the bulletin when you got here so that uh, you can get to know us a little better, so we can get to know you a little better. And I promise you, we're not going to spam you. We're not going to inundate you with phone calls. Um, we just want you to know a little bit about our church. And we want you to see if maybe this could be a place that you like to hang out a little bit more often. So we do thank you so much for being here today. Uh, while you're doing that, I want to tell you a little bit about the Alice Church and what we believe. Uh, we believe that uh, and have been praying for lives to be transformed, for people to be able to feel and love as God intended us to originally. When we first started this church, we were praying for lives to be changed. And, and as we've grown, we realize we serve a God much bigger than us. So not only are we praying that lives will be changed, we're now praying that enough lives will be changed, that our families are changed, that our communities change, that our workplaces are changed. And I believe the best way we can do that is to help people find and follow Jesus, to help people to go into a deeper relationship with Him. Our entire, our entire Christian faith hinges on one event, one historical event, which was witnessed by hundreds of people, which was recorded in ancient documents that have been handed down for over 2,000 years that we can read today, and that is simply the resurrection of Jesus Christ. An event which was recorded, an event that separates Christianity from other religions. All religions serve a God that lived and then died, but we serve a God who died and then lived. And that is what we're celebrating today. We are celebrating Easter. We are celebrating a risen Savior. I believe that that is the proof there is more to this life than this life. But being a Christian, being a Christian is much more than just dying and going to heaven. It's much more from just being delivered from hell when we die. Being a Christian is about having life and having it more abundantly. Because I know that sometimes, since we saw in that video, a lot of us feel like they've been robbed. They, they feel like their devastation, our circumstances get bad. Jesus tells us that, that the thief's job is to come and to steal or, and to kill and destroy. And how many of you ever had your joy stolen? How many of you have ever had your finances killed or maybe a, a relationship destroyed? I thank God that he doesn't leave us with the thief. Jesus goes on to say that we are to have life and we're to have it more abundantly. That is the hope, the salvation. That is what we find in the Easter story. And that's why we're going to tell you right up front. That's why we're asking you that if you will come back next week and join us as we start a brand new sermon series called The Abundant Life. As we start this series to, to show us the life that God intends for us to have. You were created in the image of the living God. And he wants you to feel that love, have that abundance that Jesus came to give us. The hope I found is in the Easter story. The hope I hope you find today is in the Easter story. And I want you to know that this is not just something that I preach. For those of you who know me, you know, you know that, that I know what it's like to, to suffer financial loss. I know what it's like to, 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 to see some things in my life not go so right. We, we've got kids that have chronic health problems. I've had health issues. I've had relationships uh, that uh, have ended badly. I've had financial loss. I've had business loss. But I know this. God gave me hope and God gave me victory. He can do the same thing for you as well. Maybe some people in here are going through some difficult times. Maybe some people here are reaching out for something that's bigger than you are. Because Easter was spread over three days, wasn't it? On Friday, there was a day of suffering and pain and agony. On Saturday, there was doubt and confusion and misery. But on Easter, on Sunday morning, what we're celebrating today, there was joy, there was hope, and there was victory. And if you've lived as long as I have, you know that we repeat those days over and over again in our lifetime, don't we? We have those days like Friday, and we have those days like Saturday, and we have those days like Sunday. 
And when you're in the first two days, sometimes you're taking that, what do I do to get through these days of my pain? What do I do to get through this pain and get to the victory? And I think the answer is what we celebrate today. I think the answer is simply Easter. So in a few minutes, we're going to take a morning offering. But before we do, uh, let's get some blood pumping. If you're physically able, will you stand with me? Will you join our musicians as we sing? And remember, there is more to this life than this life. We want you to live life and live it more abundantly. And I'm going to ask you if we can, let's bow our heads and ask God to take over this service. Heavenly Father, you are the creator of all. Today is the day of Easter joy. Father, this is the beginning on which the Lord appeared to men, the ones that had begun to lose their hope. You opened their eyes to what the scriptures had foretold. That first he must die and then he would rise again and ascend into the Father's glorious presence. May the risen Lord breathe on our minds and open our eyes so that we may know him and follow him in his risen life. And we ask you to grant this through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Church, and I'm so humbled to be here again. My name is Bryce Warren. I'm the music director up here. And first, I just want to give another round of applause for the musicians that came out this Sunday. They are excellent. And I'm simply an amateur working with professionals, so it's truly an honor to work with them. Um, so now we get to the part. I want to tell you what we do here at the Odyssey Church. We want to be a church that reaches out to the, to the generation between, you know, the ages between 18 and 30. Because it's that generation that really slipped away from church. It's because, you know, the reasons could be, you know, because church is not cool or church is not fun. And we want to make church a place that you want to be. Not just a place you have to be because you're obligated to be here because you grew up, you know, your parents made you go to church and now you have to go because you just have that obligation. It doesn't work like that, because if you just show up every Sunday, all right, I'm cool with Jesus, that's cool, I'll just go out for the rest of the week to do whatever I want, as long as I just show up every Sunday. It doesn't work like that. We want church to be a place that you want to come to. Like, you wake up in the morning, and you're just so excited, like, all right, I'm going to church, I'm going to have fun, I'm going to bless the Lord, sing praise, and just have a blast. And that's what we want to do here at the Odyssey Church. We want the church, we want, we don't, we want it to be less churchy, if you know what I'm saying, Amen. and make it more fun and bring people off the streets and into the church. And that's why God had us planted here in the Selbyville area. God, God, planted, God had a plan, and he wants this church here. And just through all the stuff, that, through this, all this stuff that we're going through, I mean, through our tithes we're collecting and through our donations online, we're not... We haven't, uh, no one has been taking a salary. Nobody. And <laughs> I and I truly, I'm sorry, that's not funny, but. <laughs> and I truly wonder how those, including our pastor, you know, gets by without a salary. And it's amazing to me how God, I mean, has shown me how God really wants this to happen because he's been taking care of our pastor, our techie back there, everybody who needs a salary. He's been taking care of us somehow. So that tells me. That God truly wants us in this area to bless this community because they really need it. So with that, I'm going to go off into the prayer. Dear God, I'm thankful for everybody gathered here today. And I, and, I'm, and I know that there's nobody here that's here by mistake. That they're not supposed to be here. They're here because you wanted them here, God. I just pray that you open our mouths and you open our minds and open our souls to reach out and take in what's about to come for us from the message from our pastor here, and into what's little left of singing. Just open our open our senses to receive you, Lord, through any way possible, God. And I just pray that you bless this church, bless this country, bless everybody here today, because you have risen. And I pray this in your heavenly name. Amen.
Why do we as Christians talk so much about Jesus' death? Everywhere we look, in churches, around people's necks, everywhere, death seems to be yelling at us. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Why do we talk so much about death as Christians? You know he really lived a good life. Yeah, he sure did. Is the world ultimately a cold place? Does death really have the last word? Perhaps death does have the last word. Perhaps despair is the best response in a world filled with fear and corruption. Light seems to be squeezed out by the darkness. It's easy to be cynical in a world filled with death. Sometimes it seems we relish being cynical about death. But Christ doesn't speak so much about death. God only allows three days of such talk. Now, in Mark's Gospel, Christ tells his followers three times, I must die. But he speaks ten times about his resurrection. You see, Easter is Christ reminding us that God hasn't given up on us. The world matters. We matter. And uh, the violence, cynicism, hatred, and oppression, those things will not prevail and they cannot last. And just when you think it's over and lost, just when you think it can't possibly be put back together, hold on. Because God is doing a new thing. Renewing, regenerating, reintroducing, restarting, and restoring. Death isn't allowed in. Who is allowed in? Who is allowed to be renewed, restarted, and restored? We are, even us, the same people, only transform. Can you believe it? Resurrection! Now God says that uh, when the, the, the greed and oppression and cruelty that you see and witness all around you seems like it's gonna win, it is right then that resurrection occurs. And God wins, Christ wins. Resurrection. Open the Go watch it. Open the Go watch it. Open the Saints go watch it. Open the Go watch it. We are Easter people. Now God says to live like Easter people. People that know that death does not have the last word. People that live on this side of the resurrection. We are Easter people. We are Easter people. Oh, the Go Easter, Easter people. Amen, amen. Aren't you glad when we talk about Christ that it's not just about death and dying? So often we go to church and that's all we talk about. But Christ is not about just going to heaven when we die. It is all about living a joyous life, having life, and having it more abundantly 
right now. Amen. You are all created in the very image of our living God, and He wants you to have that life. So once again, I want to welcome you here to the Odyssey Church, and uh, we're so glad that you're able to join us this morning. And, uh, you know, sometimes we, we come together and we gather, and I uh, especially want to welcome those who may be visiting us for the first time. Uh, in case I forget to end uh, the service, I forget to remind you, we are starting a new sermon series uh, next week called The Abundant Life, because we want you to know how to live life and live it more abundantly, as Jesus told us to do. And I want you to know, I absolutely love Easter. Easter is like my favorite time of year. It's a special time of year, but it, you know what? It's also just a little odd, isn't it? Because it's, it's not like you come here and you don't know what we're going to talk about, is it? You sort of know what the message is going to be before you ever walk in the door. And, and you know, there's people out there who only come to church uh, twice a year. They come to Easter and they come at Christmas time. And I sort of get that. I sort of understand that because they're like, every time I come to church, man, they're just talking about the same old thing. They got two messages. They preach them every time. So <laughs> that's why I want you to know we're going to have this new sermon series so that, that you know that's not all we always talk about. So. Anyway, if you're here for the first time, and maybe for those who come regularly, we want you to know just a little bit about the Odyssey Church. I want you to know that we believe, I believe, that Easter is one of the best times of year to become a Jesus follower. It's one of the best times of year to become a Christian. Uh, now, I want you to know there's never a bad time to make that decision, but Easter is sort of special. It's, it's the perfect weekend for anybody who's ever considered putting their faith in Jesus Christ, anybody who's you know, sort of decided that, that maybe there is something to this Jesus thing after all. So maybe you're at a point in your life where, where you've been coming and you've been following Jesus and, and you're starting to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And I think Easter's the perfect time to sort of seal the deal, the perfect time to make that kind of commitment. Now, I don't like surprises, so I sort of assume everybody else doesn't either. So we just want you to know at the end of the service, we're going to give you an opportunity to make that decision. We're going to give you an opportunity to take a step in that direction. Now, that's you. Uh, we want to show you, we want to give you a chance uh, on what to do and how to do it next and, and uh, what it really means. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And, and maybe some of you have been coming for a while. You know, we, we started out this church with a, a sermon series called Follow and See uh, because so often I think churches get it mixed up. They, they tell you to come to the altar, change your way of living, repent from your sins, and start following Jesus. But Jesus never really said that. Jesus said, come and see if I am who I say I am. You follow me. And he said it's going to come with a cost, but it'll be all worth it in the long run. So, I've been doing that, and today is the day that uh, you decide that, that there really is something. We want to give you an opportunity to do that. Or maybe just come because this is what you do on Easter. It's just a tradition. You come to church on Easter. We're, we're praying God has brought you here today to see that there is something that is creating all this. That, that, that there's, wherever there's a creation, there has to be a creator. Uh, maybe you're going through some difficult times, like we talked earlier, and, and you tried to handle it on your own, and you just know that it's not possible. So you need something that's bigger than you are, someone who's bigger than you are, to help you out. You know there's something to all this Jesus stuff, and you know you need to make some lifestyle changes. Maybe you need to make some changes in your family, maybe in your finances, maybe in your marriage. You tried to do it on your own, and it just hasn't worked out. Or maybe... You know, you got postcard and mail, you decided to be here. But whatever the reasons, we want you to know that we started this church for people just like yourself. And, and, and you're, you're, you're sort of the, the ones that give us all this anxiety every time we get up here and speak. Because the ones that come to church every week already know the message. But we also want you to know that God loves you, that we love you, and we want you to be able to share in the love that we found in Jesus Christ. And people have heard the Easter message so often that sometimes we sort of get a inoc inoculated to it. We, we, we hear it so often that we just sort of don't pay attention to it. So how do we make it fresh and new every year? And, and the fact of the matter is we can't. But the Holy Spirit can. So we've been praying for you. We've been praying for this church. We've been praying for the people that would be here today. That today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll see a sovereign God. You'll see a risen Savior. And today will be the day of your salvation. So again, at the end of the day service, we'll give you the opportunity to become a follower of Jesus, to become part of that elect group of people that call ourselves Christians, and we're going to give you the opportunity to make that commitment to follow Jesus. Now, the second thing we want you to know is that we're a church that believes that really Jesus really did die, that he really was buried, 
that he really did rise from the grave. It wasn't just his spirit. It wasn't just a made-up story. That this is a true historical account. This church believes, I believe, that Jesus actually died on the cross, he was buried, and then he rose from the dead. We believe there's more to this life than just this life. And if you're still not sure of this Jesus thing, we understand that. We were all in your shoes at one time. But I've been praying that today that, that when you see the evidence, when you see the facts, that you'll know that this is real. That this isn't just something a group of people get together and, and say. That, that there, this, is, this is something that can be life-changing for you. But, Jesus says it does come with sacrifice. So, we're going we're gonna to get into the message in just a few minutes, but you know, one of the things I think that keeps people from becoming Christians is Christians. We want you to try to make that decision in spite of the fact that maybe you've known some Christians and they weren't very Christ-like. Or maybe you worked for a Christian and maybe they, you didn't think their business practices were very Christ-like. In spite of the fact that every one of us, even the pastors, at some time or other become sort of hypocritical, I'm going to challenge you to at least consider being a Christian today. In spite of the fact that maybe there's some pain in your life. Maybe there's some pain you don't understand. Maybe you have some questions that I can answer or I can't answer. Or maybe there's some questions that, that nobody can answer in this lifetime. In spite of all of that, we want you to at least consider becoming a Christian. Because here's the, the great news. Here's the good news of the gospel. The foundation of Christianity is not based on Christians. It's not based on how Christians act. The foundation of Christianity is not based on your circumstances. The foundation of Christianity is not even based on the fact that you've had some prayers that God has an answer. The foundation of Christianity, the foundation of being a Christian addresses something. The foundation of it is something that is unexplainable. It, it, it's, it's not plausible. It, it's not even sort of, there's no other credibility about it. The only thing that makes Christians Christians, the only reason this could happen is for an event that took place. And, and there's no plausible explanation other than that. And that is what we're celebrating today. That is the Easter. Now I want you to think about this. There are millions and millions and millions of people all over the world that are celebrating a Jewish carpenter who only had a public ministry for about three and a half years. That according to the experts, he never traveled more than 30 miles from his hometown. That he never wrote a book, physically wrote a book. That he was executed, and executed in a way that was reserved for the worst of the worst. And yet in spite of all that, over a third of the world's population is gathered today, this weekend, in places all around the world. They're lifting their hands up. They're singing to this Jewish carpenter. They're praising his name. They have dedicated their lives to serving him. And there's no plausible explanation of that except what we celebrate at Easter. What we're celebrating is a, a historical event. It's an event that was witnessed by over 500 people. It was an event that has been recorded in history, that has been preserved for over 2,000 years in ancient documents. It's an event that no one has ever been able to disprove, even though many have tried. And that is the event of the resurrection, of the rising from the dead, of this Jewish carpenter that we call Jesus Christ. And because of that, because of Easter, I would like you to at least consider becoming a Christian today. Because this risen Savior promises you a better life, a more abundant life in both this world and the next world. And it doesn't make any sense to go through life it doesn't make any sense to go through life denying what we all know is inevitable. I mean, I, I, I've done the research, I've looked, I've tried to schedule, as far as I can tell, the mortality rate around the world is still at 100%. You know, at one point in time, we're all going to have to face that doesn't make any sense to deny or not pay attention to what we all know is inevitable. But 
does death really have the last word? Or is there more to this life than this life? Aren't you glad Jesus spoke more about the resurrection and the kingdom of God and the afterlife more than he ever did about death? And I love the statements we just heard on that video. That video was great because it says that Easter is Jesus reminding us God has not given up on us. That the world matters. That we matter. That you matter. And just when we think everything is over and lost, just when you think it can't be put back together again, you just hold on because God's doing a new thing. He's renewing. He's regenerating. He's restoring. Death is not the end. And God welcomes us, each one of us, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, God welcomes us to become Easter people. God welcomes us to be transformed, to be changed, to be resurrected, to live life, to have life, and have it more abundantly. The only condition he puts on that is that we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the only thing condition that he puts on it. And we're allowed in. And when you put your trust and your faith in Jesus, God wins, Jesus wins, you win. It's just so simple that most people miss it. So we invite you to follow Jesus and see if he is who he says he is so that you can live as Easter people as well. So you can know that death does not have the last word and you can live on this side of the resurrection so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. But this is a church, so I guess we ought to get to Scripture sooner or later. So. <laughs> So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn it to Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to begin in verse 1. That's the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, verse 28. And if you don't have a Bible, that's okay, because the Word's going to be up here on the screen. And we invite you to take one as you leave. They're on the counter right there. They're free. There's no charge. They're the New Living Translation, which I normally speak out of it, because we believe that if you read the Scriptures and apply the principles to your life, whether you believe in Jesus or not, your life will be better. Amen. At least in this world. You can't promise anything in the next world unless you do as the Apostle Paul says. And he says that we never confess with our mouth that Jesus was raised from the dead and believe in our heart that Christ is Lord. So this morning I'm going to tell you right up front that we are, we are hoping that this is what you see. That we hope this morning you see that Jesus' destination was the cross. That his message was love and you and I were the reason he came. His message was the cross, or his destination was the cross. His message was love, and you and I are the reason that he came. I want you to know there's more to this life than this life, and I want you to know how to get what's after this life. So as you turn to Matthew 28, I'm going to start out with a quote from Jesus. It's found in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is talking to one of his disciples. And I, and I know this is sort of strange for some of you, maybe, but Jesus is talking to one of his disciples after he was dead, after he was buried, and he rose again. So here's Jesus, and, and John is this man's name, and he's seen Jesus die on the cross, he's seen him buried in grave, and now he's talking to him. And Jesus looks to his friend John in the first book of Revelation, and he says, I am the first, and I am the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive. And he says, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and the grave. Now, to me, that's an amazing statement. What Jesus is saying is before anything else was, I was. And after everything that you see here is gone, I still will be. I am alive today even though you saw me dead. I have been raised from the dead, and I will be alive not just for today, not just for a couple more years, but for all of eternity. We don't serve a God like some do that lived and died. We serve a God that died and then lived. And he tells us right up front that he holds the keys to life and death. The very breath that we take is given to us by him. That's the Jesus I want you to see this morning. That's the Jesus that I want you to put your faith and your trust in. Not just the Jesus that died on the cross, but a Jesus that rose from the grave and is alive today. So the question becomes, why is Easter so important? Why is the resurrection so important? And I think the answer to that is sort of because there's more to this life than just this life. And I want you to have that. This church wants you to have that. I want you to have the assurance that this life is not the end. That death isn't the end. Death does not have the final say. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central fact of Christian history. There would be no church without the resurrection. 
There would be no Christianity without the resurrection. That everything we believe hinges on this one historical fact, and that is Jesus Christ was raised from the grave. The Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was one of Jesus' uh, greatest disciples. He, he wrote about half the New Testament chapters in your Bible. And, and in one of those chapters that he writes to his friends in Corinth, what we call 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you are still guilty of all your sin. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are to be more pitied than anyone else in the world. Now what, what Paul is saying in that is, if there's no resurrection, why pay any attention to anything else the Bible says? Why pay any attention to what the pastor has to say? Why would you believe anything that Jesus had to say if the resurrection wasn't true? Paul says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Paul's a liar. I'm a liar. All the people who wrote the scriptures are lying. So why would you pay anything attention to it? That Jesus himself was a liar. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then you might as well live any kind of way that you want to live because there's no reward after you die. You might as well get everything you can get right now. There's no reason not to cheat. There's no reason not to lie. There's no reason not to steal. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, you might as well live any kind of way that you want. But, but if Jesus did rise as the Bible says, if he did live as the Bible claimed, if he did, if he was buried as the Bible said, if he did rise, it's the historical proof, the evidence says he did, then that changes everything. That changes everything. Because that means there's more to this life than this life. And the Bible says the only way to have that life is to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. The resurrection is the proof that death has been conquered. The resurrection gives us hope. It gives us meaning to whatever it is that we're going through. The resurrection assures us that Christ is alive and living. The resurrection says that Christ is ruling his church and ruling the world. And he is in control of whatever it is that you personally are going through. And that brings us comfort. That brings us hope. That brings us joy. That gives us, no matter what you're going through, the promise of victory one day. And the resurrection is what unites us as Christians. The resurrection, and I mean, I think Christians look different. Some of us practice different doctrines. We have different theologies. We speak a little different. We act a little different. But we all share one common belief. And that is Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That he is alive today. And that he is in control today. And since the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, here on earth, his destination was the cross. From the very beginning of his earthly ministry, Jesus began saying things like, for as Jonah was three days in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he began to say things like, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And as Jesus got closer to the cross, he began to be more and more specific. The last time Matthew records what Jesus has said, he leaves no doubt. Matthew writes that Jesus said, we're going to Jerusalem. When we get to Jerusalem, the Son of Man, meaning himself, will be betrayed into the hands of the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He'll, they'll condemn him to death. He'll be turned over to the Gentiles, over to the Romans, where he will be flocked, mocked, and crucified. And on the third day, he will rise again. Now, now I know you've probably all heard this before. Jesus came to die for us. The purpose of Jesus coming into this world was sin to die on the cross. Well, that's true, but, it, but it's only a half-truth. There's no doubt that Jesus' destination was the cross. But if that was his only purpose for coming, he could have just appeared on the scene one day and gone to the cross the next day as a full-grown adult, and it would have been finished. But the fact is, Jesus didn't just come to die for us. 
His destination was absolutely the cross, but before he could die on the cross, he had to live this perfect life. He had to live a life that was completely sinless. So Jesus didn't just come to die for us, he came to live for us as well. And he came to live under the law of God, which each one of us knows that we can't do ourselves. And Jesus said to his friends, he said, don't misunderstand why I came. He said, I didn't come to cancel the law of Moses. I didn't come to cancel the warnings of the prophets. He says, no, I came to fulfill that and to make them all come true. In other words, what Jesus was saying, it is necessary that I do this to fulfill the law of God so the people that put their faith and trust in me can enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, when I think about that, you know, maybe the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is not the most amazing thing. Maybe the most amazing thing is that Jesus could live a life that I could never live, that Jesus could live this, this life that was perfect, that was sinless. If you think about this, he never lusted. He never got wrongly angry. He never told a lie, not even a white lie. He always put his father's will before his will. A life of perfect obedience. Which I don't know about you, I can't even do for five minutes. So not only was the cross his destination, not only did Jesus come to die for us, he also came to live for us. His destination was the cross, but his message was love. And Jesus is God, and God is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and how they all are one, I, you know, I just simply don't understand all that. I'm not going to try to pretend that I do. But the fact of the matter is, if I could serve a God that I understood everything about, and then God would only be as smart as me, and I don't want to serve a God as smart as me. I want to serve a God much smarter than I am. In fact, I want to serve a God that His ways aren't my ways, that His understandings aren't my understanding. I want to serve a God so big that there's things I simply don't understand. But the message of Jesus was love. In fact, when Jesus was asked what was the most important thing a person would do, what was the most important law that they could keep, Jesus said, everything that's in this word, everything that God has told you can be brought down to two simple things. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He said, that is the first and the greatest command. And the second one is like it, and that is love your neighbor as yourself. He said, everything in God's word hinges on just two things. Love God, love your neighbor. Jesus, right before he died, he, he, he told his closest friends, he said, I'm going to pull it down even farther. He said, a new command I give you, love one another, love for three and a half years. What do you mean a new command? He said, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. And how much must we love each other? Well, tomorrow I'm going to give you an example of that. I'm going to be stretched out on a cross and I'm going to die for that's how much you must love one another. His message was love. We're the reason he came. Now you think about this. How much love did Jesus have to have for the people in this room? How much love did Jesus have to have at that time to be willingly go to a cross, to be mocked, to be flogged, to be beaten, to be nailed to a cross, to die? For people just like us who hurt him so badly, who have sinned so much against him. I mean, we have to see ourselves just as the ones who have crucified Christ himself. Just as if we were the ones that hammered the nails into his hands and his feet ourselves. This is the historical account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is recorded to us by a man by the name of Matthew, who not only spent three and a half years with Jesus as one of his closest companions, but also spoke to Jesus after Jesus saw Jesus die on the Roman cross and was buried. So beginning in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 28, verse 1, Matthew writes, Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit. Now we get from the other gospel writers that there were many women born. Now why were they going to the tomb? Were they going to see a risen Savior? Did they say Jesus said he would rise for three days as he come from the dead? No. They were going to anoint his body. They weren't going to see a risen Savior. They were going to go see a dead teacher. And you think about this. The men didn't even get out of bed. They stayed home. 
Nobody was looking for Christ to rise. And as you read this story, I tell you, sometimes I, I get fascinated by the fact that the Roman government seemed to have more confidence in Jesus rising from the dead than his own disciples did. Because the Roman government put soldiers, they sealed the tomb, put their stamp on it, so that this prophecy that Jesus had fulfilled, had said he would do, couldn't be take place. They, they were afraid somebody would come and steal a body, but they knew Jesus' word better than the women did, better than the disciples did. These women came with spices to anoint his body because of the law of the time. They couldn't do it on the night that Jesus died. It says, suddenly, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothes was white as snow. The guards shook with fear, and they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Now, now I, sort of, I sort of try to picture this. I, I see these women, and they're walking down the road. They've seen Jesus down on the cross. They saw him buried. They saw the, this large stone rolled in front of the tomb. And they have to be discussing, okay, we're going to anoint Jesus' body, but when we get there, the tomb has been sealed by Roman government. There's guards standing out front. And there's this large stone, this large rock in front of it. How are we going to get in there? So imagine they're surprised when they get there, and there's an earthquake that's taking place, and it's already open for them. And I, I don't know when they get there exactly what this man looked like, but sitting on top of this stone, it's this large man, man and his clothes look like lightning. And, and you know, lightning is scary, it's big. His, his clothes are, are as pure as white snow. And, and I, I picture the guards. You know, if you know anything about the Roman guards, you see them in the movie, they're muscular, strong, they're well trained, they're not afraid of anything. And all of a sudden, this earthquake hits, this, this angel appears that looks like lightning, his clothes are bright white, and they become like barn fire. <laughs> their legs are wobbling, they're looking for their one boy, they, they just pass out with fear. And notice, according to the record, the angels don't speak to the Roman guards, but they do speak to the women. So the angel spoke to the women, do not be afraid. Why do you say that? Because if you saw something that looked like lightning and clothes were white as white, you would hope the first thing out of his mouth was, do not be afraid. <laughs> Maybe some of you remember this. When, uh, when Lazarus had died, he was buried. Jesus told the men to roll the stone away so that Lazarus could get out. The angel didn't roll the stone away so Jesus could get out. Jesus was God. That would have never stopped him. The angel rolled the stone away so we could look in, so we could see that he was no longer there. He says, I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he isn't here. He is risen from the dead just as he said would happen. I think just in that verse, there's a couple of lessons here. First of all, God speaks to those who are seeking Him. You may have some trouble in your life like the guards did. He may give you some trouble so you can know His power, but He speaks to those who seek Him. And second, when I get afraid, when things don't turn out like I thought they would, when that doctor's report comes in, when that financial problem hits, when those marital troubles or relation problems hit, I know I serve a God who keeps His promise, that things will turn out just as He said they would. There's joy in the resurrection. God's still on the throne. He's alive. He's still ruling today. An angel challenges the women just like Jesus challenges us. Come and see where His body was lying. He's saying, come and see. Come and see for yourself. Don't believe anybody else. Take a look. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're seeking. You're, you're just beginning to look. Well, eternity is too long, or too long to be long. We're, we, we ask you to, to come and see. Go to a church. Go to a Bible teaching church. You know, I highly recommend the Odyssey Church, but get into a church. Read your Bible. Speak to the Lord. That's my challenge. When you're afraid, remember the empty tomb. When you're down and out, remember the resurrection. Find joy in the fact that Jesus is still alive and He's still in control. Come and see for yourself. 
Find and follow Jesus. And finally, when you see Jesus is in fact the risen Savior, do as the women did that day. It says, and now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were frightened, but they were also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. You know, a lot of times going out and telling other people about Jesus can be scary. Eh? But even if we're scared, we can be filled with joy. We can be renewed. We can be regenerated. We can be restored. And when we are, we're to go and spread the good news of the gospel. Invite others to come and see for themselves. And what you see in the Gospels, what we hear a little later is the energy, the excitement that these women had rubbed off on the other disciples. When we get excited about Jesus, when we get excited about the good news of the Gospel, it wears off on other people. They get excited. Now, I look at this. And it says, as they went, Jesus met and greeted them. I mean, can you imagine that? This is the Jesus that everybody's been talking about. They see Jesus and he's been beaten so badly. He has been beaten to the point that he's almost unrecognizable. They see him nailed to a cross. They see him buried in a tomb. They saw him die. And he's standing right in front of them. He says, greetings. I told you I'd be back. Now, if it was me, I'd probably go to Pontius Pilate first. Uh, <laughs> Jesus comes to his disciples. He comes to those that are seeking. He says, I told you death was not the end. I told you that I'd rise from the grave in three days. I told you that death was not the end of the story. That's so powerful. That's the Jesus I want you to see today. That's the Jesus that I worship. That's the Jesus I put my hope and my confidence in. And that's the Jesus I want you to put your hope and your confidence in. And then Jesus gives us this picture of what we're supposed to do when we meet Him. And when they ran to Him, they grasped His feet and they worshipped Him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and I will see them there. When we see the when He makes Himself aware in our heart, we are to worship Him. We're to tell others what we've seen and what we've heard. We're to tell them that Jesus Christ is alive. He has risen from the grave. And these women, they get so excited. Their excitement begins to rub off on the other disciples. And the other disciples run to the tomb as well. And when we get excited about the living God, the same thing will happen to us. But not everybody. Who sees and hears believe too. The Roman guards, they had seen the power. They had seen the earthquake. They had seen the angel. And they simply go back into the city and they tell their story. But Matthew goes on to say that when others heard their story that day, the chief priest had met with the elders and they devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money and telling them you were to say when his disciples came in the middle of the sleep in the middle of the night and he threw them away while you all were asleep. Now that's great in theory, but if you told that story, don't you think somebody eventually say, well, if, if you were asleep, how do you know it was disciples that stole his body? Not everybody that hears believes. But one thing about this, you can never explain away the facts. People have tried for years. I don't know about you, but at this time of year, there's so many documentaries, there's so many different things that come on TV. They ask things like, was Jesus really who he said he was? Who is Jesus? Did Jesus really die from the cross? And it seems like the, the skeptics get most of the headlines. We hear uh, things like, well, Jesus was only unconscious. And he came back and, and he walked out of the grave. Well, let me ask you something. Let me beat you 39 times with a cat of nine tails with glass and bone in it. Let me make you carry a 125 pound beanie on your back. Let me nail you to a cross. Let me wrap your body in a 
hundred pounds of braid clothes, including putting over your face and your mouth so you can't breathe, and then stick you in a tone for two, three days and see if you survive. Fact of the matter was, Jesus was dead. Why did he bury him in a tomb? Because that's what you do with dead people. You bury them. Jesus rose from the grave. It was witnessed by over 500 people. It was recorded in history. It's been kept for over 2,000 years so we can read it today. The resurrection of Jesus Christ still causes conversation today, but there's really only two choices. You can believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, or you'll be close to the truth. You can try to deny it or ignore it or try to explain it away. But why did Jesus have to come? Why did Jesus have to come to earth? Now, I believe the answer is simple. Because there's more to this life than this life. The Bible says man is destined to die once and then face judgment. You know, God did send Jesus in the world. That's true. Jesus saved us from our sins. That's true. But you think to yourself, why, why do you need to do that? Because the sins that we committed are already behind us. They're done with. You know, I used to pay a lot of bills. You used to play a lot of pool. If I made a bad shot or had a bad game, you know, you, you just get over it. You just, I'm glad that's over it. You move on. And sometimes we think our sins are the same way. They're done. They're over. They're behind us. How can your sin hurt you if it's, like, if it's behind you? The fact is you don't have to worry about the sin. There may be some repercussions from the sin, but what you need to worry about is the God who looks over and judges you because of the sin. And we've all sinned. Now, when you get to heaven and God asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? Now, you can stand there and you can say something like, you know, you don't let me into heaven because I've tried to live a good life. You can say, you don't let me into heaven because I did this or I did that. You could even say, y'all let me in heaven because I'm a whole lot nicer than that hypocrite down the road that calls himself a Christian. <laughs> God says none of that is going to work. That's right. God says you have to be declared righteous. So how do you become declared righteous? How do you become worthy? And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. He didn't just die for us. He lived for us. He lived that righteous life, that perfect life that none of us can live. And on that cross, God transferred all of our guilt to Jesus. God the Father counted His Son to be worthy on our behalf for His wrath. If you're like me, I look at my life and I say, if absolute perfection is what God requires, I don't have a chance. So how do I get that righteousness? that God requires for me to get into heaven. And that's the good news of the gospel, folks. God says, not only am I redeemed, bought, and paid for for the death of Jesus Christ, I am redeemed through the life of Christ. And because of His perfect righteousness, I can now stand in front of God because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and stand on His merit, and I don't have to stand on my own. Amen. Here's the catch. You have to put your faith in Jesus Christ and in Jesus' death. You have to confess your sins and make a decision to live for Him because our righteousness is not in ourselves. It's in Jesus. And apart from us, our righteousness is not our own. It becomes ours. It becomes ours when God declares it's ours by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. And what terrifies me the most, what scares me the most, is what most people think that it takes to satisfy a holy God. You ask people, what's going to get them to heaven? And they say, because I've lived a good life. Because I've tried to follow the rules. But you stand before God and you can't use that excuse. Stand before God, and you say, you know, God, I, I know I broke most of your commandments, and I know that I haven't always obeyed the rules, but you'll let me in because I'm a pretty nice guy. J.B. J. J. Burnham McGee said, "This is God's universe, and God does things His way. And you have a better way? That's okay, but you don't have a universe." And that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? It's 
God's universe and it's God's way. He says the only way into heaven, the only way into the kingdom of God is through Jesus Christ. And it's that simple. I told you at the beginning of the message, we're going to give you an opportunity to be a Christ follower today. And I can't think of a better time of year to do that than Easter Sunday. To follow Jesus Christ, to become a Christian. Always remember that it took place on Easter. What a great time to do that. If you don't believe in the resurrection and you don't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the only hope that you have is there's not a God. The only hope is that there's nothing after this life. You have no hope. You have to know you're never going to see your loved ones again. There's no reason to live a good or a moral life if there's no resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this morning I'm just going to ask you a question as we begin to close. Is where do you stand in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is death the end? Are you like the guards? That you know the truth, but you allow the things of this world to blind you? Are you like the women that went to the grave that first morning? You know the truth, but you need something more to encourage you to act upon that truth? Are you like the disciples? You know the truth. You've been walking and talking with Jesus for a while, but you sometimes miss his message. Sometimes you know the truth, but you're afraid to act upon the truth. Or we like the apostles. We know what we have seen and heard. And we unashamedly and unafraid to go out in the world and proclaim the good news. His destination was the cross. His message was love, and we are the reason he came. There's more to this life than this life. Jesus says, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys to death and the grave. But actually, stand with me as we begin to pray, pray, uh, close out the service. Now, as I told you in the beginning, I think Easter is the best time of year to become a Christian. It's always a good time, but I think Easter is a great time to do that. So what better day to become an Easter person than on Easter? You want to be renewed and rejuvenated and restored. Well, God welcomes all in who desire to be saved, and it is simply as easy as ABC. First, you have to admit that you're a sinner. C, you have to believe Jesus Christ died for your sins, and C, you have to confess Jesus is for us. If you want to become a Christian today, we're going to ask you, if you will, there's a salvation card in all the bulletins. Just fill that out, if you will, please. And that's not what makes you a Christian, but we want to be able to give you what the next steps are. We're going to ask you to fill that out so that we can mail you something and tell you where you go from here. And if you're still not sure, I'm going to ask you to remember our challenge. We challenge you to come back for the next six weeks. What do you have to lose? But let's bow our heads and let's pray. And as we do, I want you to picture the risen Savior. I want you to picture Jesus as he's on his throne. Picture him as he's still in control over your life and over his church and over the world he created. And he's telling you the very same thing that he said to those women on Easter morning. Do not be afraid. Come and see for yourself. Come and see, worship, and tell others. Imagine Jesus calling to redemption and renewal and restoration and rejuvenation. If you'd like to become a Christian this morning, I'd like to be part of the body of Christ. If you'd like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, make Him Lord of your life, just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I'm going to change the way I think so I can change the way that I act. Jesus, come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me and help me to live for you because I know I can't do it on my own. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you were resurrected from the dead and I believe that you are alive today. Amen. I believe if you prayed that prayer with sincerity in the direction your life is now towards Jesus Christ and the cross, I believe you are now an Easter person would encourage you to get into a good Bible-based church. Again, I recommend the Odyssey Church. 
I want to thank you for coming this morning. I want to thank you for joining us. I pray that you'll come back as we start our new sermon series. And please, go in the grace of the Father, the love of the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And remember, there is more to this life than this life. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Oh, and you can exit through this side door and this back door if you would like to.